my name is Evan Deardall. Um, I'm an irrigation drainage engineer out of uh, based out of Saskatoon, but I grew up in a small town, uh, Outlook, Saskatchewan, which is just located south of Saskatoon. And um, I grew up on an irrigation uh, farm with uh, my father used to sell the equipment. So I, I do have some, uh, it's irrigation's been in my whole life. So uh, I'm just going to have been asked to share just a bit about irrigation in Western Canada, kind of how we operate and uh, how we approve and how we're working towards improving efficiencies in our irrigation systems. Uh, so just generally, um, the, Canada has about a million uh, hectares of irrigated area. Um, this is based loosely based on provincial reportings in the in Statistics Canada. 80% <clears throat> of that though is located in this uh, semi-arid to arid region. Uh, so Saskatoon, Calgary, Regina, it's also kind of referred to as the Palliser Triangle. Um, but as you can see, Alberta continues to have the, the lion's share of the irrigated area with almost 650-ish thousand um, hectares of irrigated land. Saskatchewan's at about 137,000 and Quebec is 22,000. Um, so irrigated volume, uh, again, as you look at, at the distribution, about 71% of that water is used in Alberta. Um, temp between nine, approximately 9% are used in both BC and Saskatchewan. Um, the majority of crops uh, grown are field crops. So you're looking at your, uh, your canola crops out in Saskatchewan, um, beans. Uh, there are some wheat acres that are irrigated, but again, that's more for rotational purposes. Um, there is a large majority of hay and pasture land that's located in Southern Alberta. Um, that's uh, for feed for cattle. There's a heavy livestock industry in Southern Alberta in the Lethbridge area. And then the majority, the, re the remaining 13% are in fruits and vegetables. Um, so water sources on farm. Canada is a little bit more unique compared to the United States in that the majority of our water is on farm surf or sorry, uh, is surface water. So rivers or lakes um, or on farm surface, which uh, we refer to as uh, like, it's diverted from these rivers or lakes through irrigation districts. So over 80 some percent of our land, our water is uh, surface water where a good portion of the United States uses groundwater and um, that's where they've come into some issues with uh, aquifer depletion and over the last few years. So just in, just as a little bit of a, a visualization, uh, the majority of our surface water in, in Western Canada comes from the Rocky Mountains in the form of snowpack or uh, receding, uh, melting glaciers um, as it travels across the, uh, the Saskatchewan River Basin. Uh, there have been some large earthen and concrete dams uh, installed along these uh, rivers and tributaries. Um, this image here is actually uh, the Gardner Dam at Lake Diefenbaker, not far from where I'm located. Um, so from, from these uh, large reservoirs, the water is diverted into supply canals. Um, these main supply canals provide water to balancing reservoirs. They can use the water for there is recreational purposes. They supply some of the industry, uh, like the potash industry requires a lot of water. Um, municipalities, but for the majority of it, it is directed for irrigation. So again, in Saskatchewan, uh, water is a provincial responsibility. Um, every every province uh, own, 
owns and, and regulates the water within their boundaries. Um, although there is, as you can see from the last uh, image, that the water does flow across provincial boundaries. That's where the federal government has stepped in and developed these uh, water allocation boards. So there are these long-term agreements between provinces that allow flow between each province um, so that because Alberta is upstream that they don't take all the water or so they're required to allow 50% of that flow downstream to Saskatchewan and then of that 50% an additional 50% needs to be released to Manitoba. So that's how the water agreements work right now. So uh, be to become an irrigator or, or to use water, provinces issue water licenses or water right licenses. Um, so that dictates how and, and what the water is used for in each province. Um, these vary differently between each provinces, but in general, they're fairly similar that they're all trying to regulate the water use and trying to protect the resource. Um, so to become an irrigator in Saskatchewan, it's a two-stage process. So the first stage is you require an irrigation certificate. Um, so this is required for all projects over 10 acre feet, which is about 12,300 cubic meters of water. That's just kind of the low benchmark to ensure that allow some water use um, on small farms or small like for market gardens, but on the larger farms, it requires this irrigation certification. Um, these again are administered by the Ministry of Agriculture. Um, it's a process in terms of trying to maintain or ensure that the water and the, and the land being used is of uh, a suitable quality. Then the second stage is to actually get the water rice license. There's, um, so in Saskatchewan, there's two types of irrigators. There's district ir irrigators, which are part of a, a collaborative of shared infrastructure, um, canals, pipelines and such that distribute water to each farmer. Um, you, so if you're a district eater, irrigator, you would actually get your license from the district. If you're non-district -ir irrigator, so if you're pumping out of a main supply canal or river or lake, you would get your, uh, your, or your water license with the province itself. Uh, so again, ir irrigation certification, it's uh, administered by the province of Saskatchewan. Um, so the process usually requires that the, that the ministry will come out and take samples of your soil. Um, they'll test the EC and sedicity of your soil, internal drainage issues, um, and then the water quality itself. And then if they meet their minimum standards, then you, um, you will uh, be issued an irrigation certification. Um, the producer pays this amount. It's about $23,300 or $2,300 per quarter section field. Um, but it, it's mostly just the cost recovery in terms of administration, the sampling, the processing the samples. So again, yes, if, if, you're, if your land and your water is deemed a sufficient quality for, for irrigation standards set out by the province, then they can issue you an irrigation certificate. Um, so then, as I kind of laid out before, um, once you have that irrigation certificate, then you can go and apply for a water rights license. So the water rights license for non-district irrigators um, this is approved by the Water Security Agency, which is an agency within the government of Saskatchewan. Um, there is an annual fee based on how much water you, um, you withdraw. Um, again, the fee ranges between $100 and $1,000 annually. Um, really, it's, it, the fee isn't for the cost of the water, it's more again, administrative purposes and, and to ensure that there's that annual fee so that <clears throat> farmers aren't just sitting on that water rights license, they're actually utilizing it um, over time. 
<clears throat> so then with the districts, you're actually entering into a service agreement. So the irrigation districts have um, these complex infrastructure in terms of canals and pipelines. And, and they, so they have their, the district itself has a water rights license with the province, but each individual farmer then enters into a, a service agreement um, with the district. So, you, I mean, you can kind of envision it as your municipal water supplier, like you paying uh, your local water supplier for water from your tap or your sink. Um, so again, the user pays a fee to this for this service. I, you're not paying for the water, but you're paying essentially as a cost recovery for maintenance and operation of the headworks. So these irrigation districts right now in Saskatchewan, there are numerous ones. There's, there are three or four main ones. The, the South Saskatchewan Irrigation District, which is uh, in red color here. Um, the McCrory Irrigation District is yellow, um, Riverhurst and Lucky Lake. So these irrigation districts, again, are a group of um, operators. Um, these districts were originally developed and built by the government of Canada in collaboration with the province of Saskatchewan back in the 1930s and 40s, and then later on into the 60s and 70s, but have since been turned over to these irrigation district cooperatives, which are the group of farmers that own and operate the, the infrastructure from the, the river or the main canal to the farm gate. Um, just gonna note here, there is, uh, plans for expansion. Um, it's been to the West Side Irrigation Project and the Coppell Irrigation Project. So these proposed expansions are, are anticipating to um, increase the irrigated area by approximately half a million acres. So again, the the government of Canada and, and the province of Saskatchewan historically built the dams and the, and the delivery infrastructure. This was to kind of combat some of the issues of the 1930s in terms of drought and farm, um, severe drought and losses of farm income and, and to promote um, settlement in the West utilizing uh, irrigation to drive that settlement. Um, in historically, the governments have owned and operated all of that infrastructure up until the farm gate, and then the farmer entered into an agreement with the province itself. Uh, but today, that shift has happened where those um, the traditionally owned infrastructure has been shifted from the government to the private uh, sector. And so now it's owned in cooperatives or irrigation districts. Governments still own and operate some of the main canal supplies, which then service industries or municipalities, um, but that has the greater public um, impact. So they still maintain, own and operate that. So again, today we've shifted from, the government has shifted from building these large infrastructure projects to actually financing. So uh, the infrastructure bank uh, recently announced some funding for large scale irrigation projects. Um, these are long term loans, low interest secure long term loans. Um, so then the projects will be built in partnership between financing from the infrastructure bank, the provinces of Saskatchewan, Alberta, and farm groups themselves investing in them. And finally, the last thing that we, we've shifted towards is there's still a lot of research dollars to support um, environmentally sustainable irrigation. Irrigation is still one of the largest consumers of water in Canada. So, there is that public good research out there that, that needs to be done to ensure that the water is being used 
properly. So again, here's this shift. So irrigation expansion is now occurring in some areas with the recent announcements with the with the infrastructure bank, um, but so, some basins within some water basins within the Southern Alberta Irrigation District are or Southern Alberta are are at capacity and so there's no more irrigation licenses being issued or more water rights being issued so so again there's that balance that there's expansion in some areas of this of the country but there's also restrictions and there's limits placed on other areas just based on availability and infrastructure um, so again we need to make better use we need to see that as we expand, we are gonna hit that cap at some point. So we gotta make sure that we um, make best use of that water and we're getting the most out of that water. And so how do we accomplish that? Genetics, um, some breeders, we start looking at drought resistant crops or crops being able to produce more water or produce more with less water. Um, but my areas of work are, are our system efficiencies, so the conveyance and application systems, and the management. So we're looking at how how the how the producer is actually applying the water through scheduling and other methods. So again, here's just a, a general overview of of, uh, of how irrigation system systems are set up in in the prairies. You'll have your major a uh, river with a some kind of diversion, either a canal or, or either a, a dam or a weir, divert the water uh, into these secondary canals, and then they can either be removed or they'll be pumped into pipelines, pressurized pipelines for use with all the farmers. But these systems are prone to water losses. The canals are prone to evaporation and canal seepage. Um, Again, if you're using secondary canals, you will have uh, operational spill. So that is return flow, but it, it is um, taking up capacity within your system. And then the on-farm. So you're looking at the system itself losing through evaporation runoff and deep drainage. So we're just gonna look a little bit into some of the solutions here. So conveyance efficiency. Um, so a lot of the main canals have now, originally they were grassed or clay lined um, over years, they've degraded. Um, since then we've started moving towards plastic line and then you put a, a layer of riprap or rock over top uh, to protect the lining and keep it down. That will prevent, that prevents a lot of the seepage losses that we've seen over the years. Um, so, the large canals still require this open canal design. Um, a lot of the smaller canals have since been put into to a, a pipeline or a pressurized line um, for distribution, and that has saved significant amount of water through uh, evaporation and and uh, seepage. Uh, con conveyance efficiency, so. Although the water is being returned, um, if we can reduce the amount of water that's lost downstream, uh, the canal design itself doesn't need to be as large. Um, we can get more acres out of that same area because we're not, we're not, we're using that conveyance structure more efficiency, more efficiently. Sorry. Um, so the, these are just some examples of some control systems that are placed on the on the control gates at the end of canal systems. Uh, so a lot of that has become remote control or and remote monitoring. Um, so you don't have, uh, we used to refer to them as ditch riders uh, driving along and having to lift and drop gates and monitor the levels. Uh, so system efficiency. So we've come a long way oh, since the so this is similar to what was seen early in, Saska in Saskatchewan, Alberta. This was a this is a flood-based irrigation system. So you would open the you'd open the gate 
water gate at the top of the field and the water would move down and you would likely only irrigate once or twice a year uh, this method um, just because you, you are flooding your field and, and you don't want to damage your crop. Uh, then there was the move towards pressurized lines and this is a, a wheel move so uh, most of you probably are familiar with wheel moves. It's a high pressurized pipeline on wheels that you would sit in place for a uh, eight to 12 hours and then and then you would shift it slowly down the field um, manually so i mean it's highly labor intensive and with the high pressure um, also prone to wind drift and uh, evaporative losses um, in the 60s to 70s uh, we started seeing a lot of mechanized irrigation so this is a high pressure uh, pivot irrigation system. Um, so you're running, uh, you're running spray nozzles on the top of the pivot, and then it 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 uh, drops onto the crop. But as you can see on on some on a system like this, it's a fine mist, so it's very prone to uh, wind drift or evaporation. Then in in the approximately the 90s. Saskatchewan started adopting low pressure irrigation systems or low pressure drop irrigation systems. Um, so this all, I mean, it, it's exactly how it says, you just attach the hose to the top of the pivot and you drop the sprinkler down closer to that. And that really uh, helped, especially in Saskatchewan with the wind drift issues and potential evap evaporation. And, and then a, the final one would be drip irrigation, which is probably the most highly efficient. Um, we still see this a lot in our high value sector. So in our small, smaller acre, high value horticultural crops, our, our field crops, we don't, we don't use drip irrigation just for the fact of cost and labor requirements. So th this is just, I, I like showing this, this is a um, plot from Alberta showing the conversion. So we, the gravity or flood irrigation back in the 1960s used to be the majority of the, of the system used out here in Western Canada. Um, but as you can see now, well in 2015, we're probably at about 75% and I, I would say we're I think in today, we're probably at 85% of our systems now are the low pressure style. Um, very rarely are you ever gonna see any high pressure wheel move systems unless they're historic based systems that they haven't been replaced. Um, there is the water benefit, but the real driver behind this was the reduction in, in power requirements. Um, to move from a high pressure to a low pressure system. Uh, water, the water savings is important, but the power savings is what really drove it to the farmer adoption phase. Uh, just gonna touch base on a few different things. So irrigation scheduling, um, very important, but sometimes not util utilized in the lower cost or the higher, Large field scale field crops where, with a lower value. I mean, it, it can be time intensive to, to implement. Uh, usually you see this on the higher cost vegetable crops and potatoes out here in Western Canada. Um, usually on the lower cost crops like canola and beans, you tend to just, farmers just historically just operate what they've always operated so they know approximately what they need but i just want to there's some important things as we again as we hit those capacities in some of our our irrigation basins we need to start adopting some of these irrigation scheduling methods if we're going to try to expand the irrigation acres and use the water that we currently have um, so just a, a comparison uh, this was a modeled output. Um, 
it's just more for visualization. So, so if a potato crop out here required in your, in Saskatchewan about 400 millimeters of water uh, to maximize its yield, if we didn't, if we operated inefficiently, so if our our, our systems operated inefficiently, uh, we applied less or we over applied water so we had deep drainage or we had runoff or we didn't apply enough water at, at the proper time. So that 6% or that if we, if we drop to uh, like if we lost that efficiency gains, it's gonna really hit us in, in the yield. So it's just more, in, to drive home that there are a lot of different methods that we can Im imply to impose to uh, improve our efficiency of our systems and, and that will result in yield improvements. Um, so some, some of the techniques that are uh, applied out here, uh, soil-based methods. So you hand field method, you go into the field, you take a sample and you feel it for, I mean, that's a, some people still use it. It's pretty hard to actually get an accurate reading on that. Um, we look at tensiometers. Um, more and more, we're starting to see these TDR or capacitance pace because they, they can be placed in the field and they have a cellular modem or radio connection based in there. So the farmer can, can put it out of his field and, and step away and, and, monitor his soil moisture from his computer or his, or his phone. Uh, other simple methods are irrigation scheduling calculators. Um, I, I believe the government of Quebec has a calculator as well. BC government and Alberta government and Saskatchewan all have their own calculators, but basically they're climate-based. So you're, you're looking at local weather data to estimate how much the crop's using, um, and then just a simple water balance, what you put in and what comes out. You want those. To... Um, some of the area where I'm starting to do some research are plant-based. So plant-based measurements aren't actually, can't tell you how much water to apply, but they will tell you when to apply it. So we're starting to look at NDVI in terms of crop health, or we're looking at thermal. So at, as you're, if, if, the, if a crop has sufficient amount of water, um, it should be able to trans, evap, transpire sufficiently and reduce its canopy temperature. If that water is, is not sufficient, then uh, the crop heats up and it should be picked up in thermal uh, imagery. Um, but I mean, the take home message again is, is try to, um, utilize some form of irrigation scheduling. Um, it's gonna, I mean, the water savings are important, but it, it will translate into improved yields as well. Uh, final area of research that I've been working on out here in Western Canada is variable rate irrigation. Uh, so a, a center pivot like this now will be equipped with uh, uh, water nozzles and controllers. Um, so we have the ability to turn on and off sprinklers as the, as the field, as the pivot moves around the field. And, and by adjusting or pulsing those sprinklers on and off, we can adjust the depth of water throughout the field. So um, here's kind of a schematic of, a, of the polygons within a field and we can control each um, the value or, or the depth of water applied in each one of those polygons. Um, so again, like if, if you're looking at a uniform rate, if we're uh, this, is, if we're looking at irrigation uh, water use efficiency or irrigation productivity, um, uniform rate, we're going to have areas where it does very well and areas that are not quite as productive. But if we move to a variable rate, we can adjust those um, rates to match the field conditions and at least maximize some of the areas. We may not improve 
improve the water use efficiency in some areas because maybe that's uh, just not a productive area but we can better utilize that water in other areas by moving to a variable rate system so most research on on average has shown a 15 percent increase in water use efficiency again that's going to be dependent on your field uh, flat uniform field is not going to have the the increases as a quite variable multi-textural field with some elevation differences uh, just a plug for where i'm located i'm in saskatoon but i do my work at uh, csidc which is the canada saskatchewan crop diversification center in outlook saskatchewan um, it's a large multi partnered facility that focuses on irrigation research and irrigated agronomy um, so yeah again we conduct fund all types of irrigated research from agronomy to breeding to technology um, technology transfer and education and it, it kind of covers the whole gamut so we start in that technology or that research development move into technology development and then we transfer to the farmers uh, through training sessions and field days and that so that's all i've got so hopefully touched a bit on everything 